series is a series about courage. Den of lions is a term used in the book of Daniel. It refers to a story where a man in the Bible named Daniel found himself in a den of lions, surrounded not just by one lion, but several lions that were hungry and ready to eat some flesh. But Daniel had something that these lions didn't have. Daniel had something that this nation didn't have. Daniel was a godly man living in a godless nation. Daniel was a man who had convictions. Daniel was a man of prayer. He was a man who feared God. Today I wanna to talk to you from Daniel chapter one and chapter two, and the title of the message is A Different Diet. A Different Diet. Turn to the person next to you and say, A Different Diet. <laughs> you guys have seen some of those diets on TV where they show the before picture and then the after picture after they've been through that diet for 30 days or 90 days or, or I don't know, two months, three months, four months and how they changed from the diet. Daniel had not just a physical diet, but a spiritual diet. In Daniel chapter one, verse eight, it says, but Daniel determined in his heart not to defile himself by eating the food and the wine given to them from the king's table. Instead, he asked the chief of staff permission to eat something different. Daniel wanted to eat something different, and let me just tell you this before we get into it. This is a time in history where Daniel was 600 years before Jesus would come on the earth. He was 400 years after King David had ruled Israel. So Israel had experienced their greatest king yet, but they hadn't experienced the greater king that would one day come. Daniel finds himself in the middle and Israel is in exile. They've been conquered and, and overtaken by Babylon. Babylon was the biggest empire of its time. Bigger, I mean like stronger than the American empire, stronger than, than, than any empire we see happening today. They ruled the earth and the king of Babylon was King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar said, I want to find some young guys who are strong, handsome, and I want them to get in my royal service. I want them to serve me. I want them to uh, help me in every area, every matter. And so Daniel was one of those boys. He was 15 years old, taken from his mom and dad. And alongside Daniel were three other Hebrew boys that we're going to find out in this series. What was different about these guys? What set them apart from everybody else? Lord, I pray that you'd speak to us right now. God, I pray that we would have the mind of Christ, ears to hear, eyes to see, take over in this place. Lord, let us leave different than the way we came in, changed from the inside out. Lord, greater hope, greater peace, greater conviction. Lord, greater courage. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, about 60 plus days ago, I started a diet and I ended it last night and it felt good. <laughs> It was a diet of going without pop. And I, I'm, I'm a, I was a popaholic. I would drink pop like a lot. Dr. Pepper, Coca-Cola, Mountain Dew. Anybody else drink pop out there? All right, so for me, this was a big deal. Giving up pop was a big sacrifice. But the reason why I did it, you need to know, I didn't give up pop so I could lose weight, although I did lose a little bit. I didn't give up pop so that way I could, you know, say, I went without pop for such and such days. I gave up pop because my wife convinced me about 60 plus days ago that we should do a half marathon. And yesterday we completed our first ever half marathon, 13.1 miles. Come on, somebody. And you know, I heard this phrase that you know who the marathon runners are and the half marathon runners are because they tell you who they are. And I believe that now because I'm so like excited that we did it. I want to tell everyone. In fact, I brought my medal today and I might just wear my medal. I worked hard for this medal. Somebody said yesterday, they were like, how was that five mile run? I said 13.1 miles, not five. I worked hard for those. <laughs> And you know what? It was hard. Like, I wanted to quit. After mile four, I wanted to quit. Like, each mile, I was like, all right, I'm ready to stop. <laughs> In fact, a guy was out there holding up a sign, and the sign said, this idea sounded good two months ago. And I was like, that sign is for me. How did he know two months ago this idea sounded good, and now it doesn't? 
but I had the perseverance and my wife was also shouting at me, keep going, keep going, keep going, challenging me and my brother-in-law, Justin. We were all three running it together, encouraging each other. You know, when I gave up pop, there was days, especially in those first two, three weeks where I had withdrawals. Anybody been there before? Where it's like, you're just like, oh, I need a Coca-Cola. I can't eat pizza without a Coca-Cola. I can't eat a hamburger without a Dr. Pepper. You know, it's like certain foods just go good with pop. You know what I'm talking about? Am I the only guy in here that struggles with pop? Okay. Some of y'all are like, no, I've been free from pop for a long time. (laughs) You know what? It felt so good, though. It changed my appetite. It changed my endurance. I started training, running. And before, when I would drink pop all the time, I would get super tired and fatigued and I would, you know, have to cough up a bunch of spit stuff after two or three miles. I know you don't want to hear any of this, but I'm going somewhere with this. So just hang with me. But it started changing me. Like I I could run longer. I could run faster. I wasn't coughing up anything. I was breathing well. And see, Daniel knew if I'm going to endure the race that I'm called to run and not just get a medal, that tarnishes and fades, but run a race where I get a crown that outlasts all the other medals and crowns. If I'm going to run the spiritual race that I'm called to run, then I'm going to have to eat different than everybody else. It wasn't just about a physical diet. I don't want you to think that today I'm preaching to you about some sort of physical diet. I'm talking to you about your spiritual life. If you want to live on a higher level, you've got to eat on a higher level. If you want to fly like an eagle, you can't eat like a chicken. If you want to soar like an eagle, you can't eat like a chicken. If you want to roar like a lion, you can't eat like a chicken. You've got to have the appetite of a lion. You got to be hungry for the word of God. You got to be hungry for time in God's presence. You got to be a prayer warrior. If you're going to face the mouths of lions, you better have the heart of a lion because it takes the heart of a lion to stand up against the mouths of a lion. Roar! I came this morning ready to preach. I'm stirred up. I had too much coffee and too much prayer time this morning. Listen, y'all. No matter what happens in our nation, Daniel found himself in a completely pagan nation godless and yet he changed his entire nation he turned the heart of a king from being godless to being a believer that there was a god you have the heart of the king you have the heart of that king but you also this week have the ear of the earthly kings for you to say i'm not really going to vote I don't really like anyone. You're basically saying, I'll take whatever the table serves. Whatever they're serving from the table, I'll drink the wine they're serving, the food they're serving. I'll take the laws that they pass and the people they elect. But Daniel said, no, if I get a chance, if if my voice matters, I'd like to put my voice out there. I'd like to change the way things look. You know, millions of people would love to have the chance to let their voice count And I think it's important for Christians to not just stay silent, sit in a corner, take whatever the king's table is serving, but to say, I'm going to make my voice count. I'm going to stand for convictions found in this word. And if I can't find someone that has all of them, I'll find someone that's close enough to some of them. But I'm not just going to be quiet and be intimidated by the culture and intimidated by the news and just taking whatever toxicity they're feeding me. I'm going to look different. Daniel was different. Why was he different? Now, look at this. In verse 3, it says, King Nebuchadnezzar ordered his staff to find these young guys and and to start training them in the ways of Babylon. He said, I want you to teach them how to speak like us, how to think like us. I want you to teach them how to serve in our royal palace. And it says in verse five, the king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. Now, it wasn't that Daniel was thinking, I want to be holier than thou. I'm going to be better than these guys. It's just that Daniel had different convictions. Instead of allowing his conditions to set his convictions, he let his convictions change his conditions. That's good right there. That was a spiritual bomb. (laughs) Who's setting your convictions? 
I remember going to ORU and talking with guys who said, man, when I lived in this state and I went to this school, I got to drink whatever I want to drink. I got to do whatever I wanted to do. We didn't have like curfew hours. And now ORU doesn't have curfew hours. And that's awesome. I didn't have that when I was there. But there were certain things like, you know, I got to go club and I got to do whatever I wanted to do. I didn't get in trouble when I was drunk and all this stuff. And ORU has this honor code. And a lot of people live based on what other people give them an honor code for. My company allows me to do whatever I want to do so I get to do, yeah, but you have convictions before you went into that company. Don't let the company shape your convictions. Let your convictions shape your company. See, I love how Chick-fil-A was brought up this morning because Chick-fil-A has changed the culture of fast food restaurants. While all these fast food restaurants are serving food on Sunday and all of us are thinking about Chick-fil-A, we can't get any Chick-fil-A today. Why? Because they're closed on Sunday. Why are they closed on Sunday? Because they honor God. They tell their staff, go to church, do something, take the Sabbath, rest. Did you know the CEO of Chick-fil-A, he serves in his church as a Sunday school teacher, mentoring teenage boys. That man and his family has made an impact on our culture because they said, we're not going to live like everybody else. We're not going to let McDonald's set the honor code for how we do things. We're going to do things differently. We're going to have some different conditions convictions. We're not going to let America set our convictions. Our convictions are going to change America. Who is setting your convictions? For Daniel, he said, I'm going to be different. I'm going to live different. I'm going to think different. You can change my name. You can change my language, but you can't change my character. Look what happens in verse seven. The chief of staff says, we're going to rename these guys. So Daniel and his three friends were four of the boys that were selected, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Daniel, which meant God is my judge, was changed to Belshazzar, protect the king of Babylon. Hananiah, the Lord is gracious, became Shadrach, commander of Aku, the Sumerian sun god. Mishael, meaning who is like the Lord, became Meshach, who is what Aku is, Babylonian god of the moon. That's a little confusing. Azariah, the Lord is my helper, became Abednego, servant of Nebo, a Babylonian god. There was a song that came out when I was in high school. I used to listen to some country music. And the song went like this. You could take the girl out of the honky tonk, but you cannot take the honky tonk out of the girl. And what it meant was you could take a boy out of Oklahoma, but you cannot take the Okie, the redneck, out of the boy. In other words, there's just some things that stay with you no matter where you go. And this was the way it was for Daniel and his friends. Their names were changed. Their language was changed. Their clothes had changed, but their identity remained intact. They knew who they were. You can change me, but you can't change my character. You can try to change my surroundings, but you can't change my character. So their convictions were intact. Can I tell you this morning, you've been stamped with God's DNA. Before your parents could give you their genes, before you could get the DNA of your family, God has already stamped his DNA on the inside of you. Before anyone could tell you who you are, God already said you're a child of God. You're a son of the king. You're a daughter of the king. So no matter whether you're wearing a Taco Bueno outfit, whether you're wearing a baseball jersey, a basketball jersey, a teacher uniform, whether you're dressed up to work at Quick Trip, or whether you're dressed up in a suit to work at Williams Company, you are a child of God. You are not defined by where you work, what salary you make, what school you go to, what kind of education you've been brought up in, who your parents are. No, you are a child of the Most High King. You are royalty. Turn to someone next to you and say, you are royalty. Sometimes the devil tries to convince us that because now we're in this new season, this new job, we're not that important anymore. I mean, Daniel and his friends now, they were imported hostages. Teenagers thrown into serving the king for whatever he wanted. A godless empire. And yet they had an internal disposition. Their soul was at peace. They knew who they were. Do you know who you are? Have you forgotten who you are? Today, come back to that place. See, Daniel knew if we're going to face the things that are down the road, if we're going to live in Babylon, in Babylon, there's lions everywhere. In Babylon, there's threats 
everywhere. In our world today, in the 21st century, there are threats everywhere. If you're going to make it, not just survive, but thrive, you better get the heart of a lion if you're going to face the mouths of lions. It takes the heart of a lion to stand up against the mouths of lions. And I'm telling you, you will face danger. You will go through trouble, but be of good cheer. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. So come what may, I'm standing. The devil wants the church to be quiet, to shut up, sit in a corner, don't show up to the polls, don't vote, take whatever the table serves, drink whatever the king's serving, drink his wine, eat his food, just let the laws be passed, don't ask for anything different. But Daniel said, hold up, I got a voice. And my voice matters. My voice matters. I'm not better than anyone, but I'm going to use my voice to change my culture. I'm not going to let the culture change my voice. I'm going to use my convictions to change my conditions. I'm not going to let my conditions change my convictions. Many of us are just taking whatever the table serves. They said, here's your rations. Here's your wine. You drink what we drink. You eat what we eat. Daniel said, permission to have a different diet, permission to live differently. It takes courage to stand up. I want to encourage you this week, be a voice, go and vote. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but vote as close as you can to whatever this word of God says. As a Christian, if you believe in God, you are a citizen of heaven placed in a nation on earth, and you are not one of those people that's gonna bunker down, be quiet, be absent, show up, speak up, stand up, do something. Make your voice count for the city, for the state, for the nation. Daniel had the ear of the king because he was in tune with the heart of a greater king. Daniel would impact his nation because he was courageous enough to use his voice. How many people are missing the impact? We're afraid. Daniel thrived in a godless nation. I don't care what happens in America. You can thrive. I don't care what country you've been placed in. You can thrive. If Daniel thrived in Babylon, you can thrive in America. If Daniel thrived in Babylon, you can thrive in your company, in your family, in your university, in your country, in your city, wherever you're at. You've got to have different convictions. And so Daniel asks permission. It says in verse nine, now God gave the chief of staff both respect and compassion towards Daniel. God is the author of your promotion. He's the source. He wants to give you favor in the eyes of your boss. How many of you guys could use some favor in your company? Favor where you work. Favor with your supervisor. I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer that when we're obedient to God, we are attracting God's favor into our life. God's looking for someone who is living set apart, consecrated for his use. If he can find a man that's consecrated, he'll take him to places he's never dreamed of going to. You have a destiny that requires a different diet. Of course I'm free to do whatever I want to do, but is it going to help propel my destiny or is it going to destroy my destiny? It takes a lifetime to build a reputation. It takes one minute to lose it. And so often we feed our flesh whatever it wants. Sexual immorality, lust, take a little bit more money than you should, cheat people in other ways, lie to people. We live in a godless culture, but we can dare to be a Daniel and live godly even when we're surrounded by godless societies. Come on, church. This is a good time to say amen right there. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Tim Tebow, a famous athlete, was asked this question, and, and they said, Tim, how come you are so bold about your faith? I mean, you pray for people publicly after uh, Major League Baseball games. You bow down and worship God on a football field. You, you're so outspoken about your purity, how you're waiting till your wedding day, uh, 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 sexual purity. You're so outspoken about your convictions. I love what Tim Tebow said. This was really good. He said this. When your identity is found in Christ, your identity never changes. When your identity is found in Christ, put me in a football uniform, put me in a baseball uniform, 
put me in a party, put me in the university, my identity never changes. My convictions don't change by who I'm hanging out with or what company I'm working for. So many people are like, are like chameleon lizards. They change their color based on who they're hanging out with. If these people are doing this, I'm going to do this too. If these people don't do this, well, I, I won't do it either. What if you were to stand out and be different than everybody else? Not because of some rules and rituals, but because you have a deep conviction about your destiny that you want to live to make an impact on society. So Daniel and his friends, they stood out. And it says that the man who was in charge of them said, I'm afraid if I let you eat what you want to eat and drink what you want to drink, the king is going to have my head. I'm going to lose my head. I mean, he is going to kill me. And here's the thing about fear of man. When you fear God, you fear nothing else. But when you don't fear God, you fear everything else. When you fear God, Oswald Chambers said, when you have a healthy fear of God, not afraid of God, but a sense of honor and reverence, and I'm living for the audience of one, not for the applause of everybody else. But when you don't care about him and you do whatever you want to do, you're afraid of everything around you. You're paranoid about who's going to be your president. You're paranoid about every law that's going to, you're worried about your job and worried about your finances and you're worried about your marriage and you're worried as a single and you're worried as a married person. But when you fear God, you fear nothing else. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. See, we don't have to be afraid in this world. We can have peace and courage. And so Daniel looked at this man. He said, listen, put us to the test. Put our diet to the test. If we look different than the guys who've been eating what the king is serving, drinking what the king is serving, after 10 days, if we look different, then let us keep this diet. But if we don't, We'll eat and drink whatever you guys want us to. And sure enough, after 10 days, your diet will be tested. People will watch you. They will say, I thought you, I thought you were a Christian. I thought you gave your life to Jesus. And there has to be a before picture and an after picture. This is who I was. This is who I am. Am. I used to be a drug addict. I used to be a womanizer. I used to be an alcoholic, but today I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Things have to change. And it's not some religious thing. It's the internal transformation of the soul. The more that we surrender to God, the less we really want to live like the world. And we realize the illusion of the world, that it's not condemnation, it's conviction. It's going, I don't really need all that stuff. I'm satisfied with what God provides for me. I'm satisfied with what God's given me, the good things that God has blessed me with. And so Daniel and his friends, they pass the test. They look healthier, they're better nourished. And after that, the attendant gave them the diet they asked for. And it says in verse 17 that God gave these four men unusual aptitude. Everybody say unusual. God's going to give you unusual wisdom, wisdom beyond your years. God's going to give you unusual skills. Don't forget who your source is. You're not a self-made millionaire. Who gave you those legs? Who gave you that brain? Who gave you those eyes? Who gave you that intellect, that ability uh, to use your muscles, that ability to use your wits and your skills? God is your source. Daniel said, it was God who gave us unusual aptitude. It was God who gave us wisdom beyond our years. It was God who gave me special abilities. So many people are trying to do it DIY, do it yourself. But when you're a Christian, you need the help of God. When you're not a Christian, you realize you can't be satisfied without God. It's God alone who gives us strength, wisdom, and ability. Don't forget who your source is. He still has stored up wisdom for you. Some of you are facing situations that are beyond your education, beyond your wisdom, beyond your ability. But God can supersede the areas of weakness in your life. 
If you put God in the equation, he can give you supernatural wisdom, supernatural ability. It says that when the training period was over, the king brought all the boys together. Look at this. Verse 19, it says, no one impressed him more. Now look at the names he uses. He doesn't use the Babylonian names. He uses the Hebrew names. No one impressed him more than Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. Little did these four guys know that they were signing up for the greatest adventure of their lives. They would face fire. They would face lions. They would face threats at every turn. But on the inside, they had a different diet. It changed the course of their lives. Daniel and his friends decided in their hearts, you have a decision to make. God's not going to force you to change your life. I can't force you as your pastor to change your convictions. You have to decide. And you say, well, where do I find my moral compass? I mean, Paul, the laws of America are telling me this is right and this is wrong. The leaders are telling me this is a gray area. Where do I find my moral compass? Daniel and his friends, they didn't have Bibles like we do. There was no Bible back in that time. There were scrolls. And they would go back over those scrolls and look at the commandments of God. Thou shall not lie. Thou shall not steal. Thou shall not commit adultery. Thou shall not covet. Have no other God before God. They would go back over the stories of Moses, how God parted the Red Sea. They would go back over the stories of Joseph, a godly man living in a godless land of Egypt, how God used Joseph, elevated him to that time and place to change the heart of Pharaoh, to change an entire country. Daniel said, guys, we can do this. The thing I love about this story is it's a team story. It's not about one guy doing everything. It's about four guys working together sharpening each other. The Bible says iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens his friends. Who are you hanging out with? Your crew determines your view. Your crew determines where you end up and the perception of life that you have. Your crew determines your view. The people you surround yourself with, they're going to impact your political view. They're going to impact your spiritual view. They're going to impact your moral views. They're going to impact the standards you have in your life. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for my friends growing up in high school, middle school, Aaron Johnson, Daniel Mao, Daniel Henshaw, Jonathan Cousins, Daniel Nelson, several others. We would challenge each other. We're called to live different. We're called to live different. I'd be in my youth group and my youth pastor would say, Paul, God's got a plan on your life. Don't compromise. Don't compromise. Don't just blend in with culture. Don't be a chameleon. Stand out. Dare to be a Daniel. Stand out in your culture. Dare to be like Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah. Church, this is a season right now. I truly believe this is a word, not just for our church, but for the church worldwide. Our society is getting darker. There will be, and we can see it in the Bible, in the times ahead, there will be darker and darker things that happen. But the light of the church will not be snuffed out. The light of Christians coming together saying, you know what? Our best days are still in front of us. We're not going to bunker down. We're going to take ground. We're not going to say this is as good as it gets. We've got a harvest to reach. I'm telling you, every seat in this auditorium will be full on a weekly basis very soon in our 11 a.m. service. Why? Because there's people in our city that need Jesus. They need hope. They need godly friends in their life like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego challenging each other saying, come on, don't compromise. Don't compromise. Don't bow to those idols. Don't bow to that idol of depression. Don't bow to that idol of discouragement. Don't bow to that idol of antichrist. Come Come on, let's stick with this. I'm convinced that if we are consumed by the fire of God, we can stand in the fires of man. I'm con oh, Jesus. When I read the book of Daniel, everything they face, there's a spiritual point there. There's a principle. You've got to be consumed by the all-consuming fire of God if you want to withstand the fires that happen around you. These guys would get threatened every chapter. 
but they had courage. They had honor. They didn't just honor those who were godly because there weren't very many of those people there. They honored even the ungodly supervisors that they had. Some of you are in a company, in a place, and someone's in charge of you that's rude, ungodly. Maybe you're in a house right now, a family, and you've got family members that are cruel, unkind, it's cold in your house. If Daniel could thrive in Babylon, you can thrive in your house. You don't have to be overwhelmed by your surroundings. You don't have to let your conditions change your convictions. You can stand out in your family. You can stand out in your job. You can honor even the dishonorable people that you're around. And I'm telling you, when you do, you get set up for promotion. In the next chapter, it says that King Nebuchadnezzar had this dream and the dream scared him so much he didn't know what to do with it. It was a dream of destruction. And he asked everyone in the land, he said, guys, I don't know what to do with this dream. Someone interpret it for me. They said, tell us what the dream is. He said, I'm not gonna tell you the dream. You guys have to tell me what I dreamed about and interpret it. They said, no one can do that. In verse 10, they said, there's no one that can tell you your dream and interpret it. Verse 11, they said, this is impossible. Because when you leave God out of your life, things look impossible. When you leave God out of the equation, things look impossible. But there were four different guys that said, hold on, give us the problem. Give us the mystery. Give us the mountain. Bring the giant our way. We've got a God who says nothing is impossible. The God who parted the Red Sea. The God who parted the Jordan River. The God who brought the walls down of Jericho. He's on our side and he knows the secrets of men's hearts. So Daniel said in verse 14, tell me what it was. And they said, we can't tell you the dream, Daniel, but the king is going to kill everyone because no one can interpret it. And it says that Daniel handled the situation with wisdom and discretion. How are you handling the situations you're facing? Are you handling it with panic, with worry, with hostility, just freaking out, getting angry on Facebook, yelling at people over political stuff? What if you handled situations with a little bit of poise? a little bit of Christianity, since you are a Christian? What if you calmed your heart down and said, you know what? God, you have the answer to the problem that I'm facing. You have the answer to the mountain that's in front of me. You have the answer to the mouths of lions that are roaring at me and hungry. And some of you are gonna see some mouths of lions over Thanksgiving with your in-laws <laughs> and over Christmas with your mom and dad and brother and sister. You're going home to a den of lions. <laughs> And they're hungry and they're going to try to get you all riled up. They're going to speak things that just frustrate you. You're going to want to leave that. You're going to feel, but listen, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You are a royal priesthood, a chosen nation set apart for God's holy work. You've been brought out of darkness into light to show people the goodness of God. So Daniel and his friends, they, they told the king, they said, King, give us some time. We can find out this dream, but give us some time. We need to talk to our God. And Daniel said in verse 17, he told all of his friends, he said, I need you to pray. I can't do this by myself. I need godly friends in my life. You need people in your life that will pray for you when you don't know the answers to life's problems. You need a connect group. And you can get in one today, outside, after this service, in the lobby. You need godly friends. Don't put it on me to give you godly friends. It's not the pastor's job to give you godly friends. You've got to reach out from your row and you've got to connect with some people, go to Mazio's, eat some pizza and say, I need your prayers on my marriage. I need your prayers for my son. I need your prayers. Get humble enough, overcome the pride and say, I need some godly friends that are going to sharpen me to win the battlefield of the mind. You need that. And you've got to take initiative. It's not the church's job to give you godly friends. You've got to reach across the row and say, you know what? I need to humble myself and connect with some people. So Daniel gets his friends together. They pray. And that night, God gives him the answer to the equation. God gives him the answer to the dream. He tells Daniel what the dream is and the meaning of it. And look at Daniel's response. It says, Daniel then began to praise God. He says, praise the name of God forever and ever, for he has all wisdom and all power. He controls the course of world events. 
Let that sink down deep for a moment. God's not going to wake up this Wednesday and say, oh, snap, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> God is not going to be surprised by what happens this week in America. He's not going to be surprised what happens this week in your country, in your city, wherever you're watching this from. Sometimes we doubt the power of God. He is still on the throne. And he can cause you to prosper when nobody else is prosper. He can give you favor when you are under godless leaders. God can promote you. It says the God who removes kings and the God who sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise, knowledge to the scholars, reveals deep and mysterious secrets. He knows what lies hidden in the darkness, even though he's surrounded by the light. I thank you, God. I praise you, God. God of my ancestors, for you have given me wisdom and strength. You told me what we asked of you, and you revealed it to us when the king demanded. So we went to the king. He said, King, I know your dream. I didn't figure it out on my own. It wasn't anything I could do in my own ability. It was God. God showed it to me. There is a God. He says in verse 28, King, you need to know there is a God. This was the reason he was there. This was the reason God placed Daniel in a godless palace, an empire that was bigger than any other empire. It wasn't to get a good salary. It wasn't to sleep in a comfy bed. It was to change the course of a nation. You've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. You could have been born in 1907. You could have been born in 1645. You could have been born in 605 BC, but you were born in 2000. Well, you weren't born in 2000, but you're alive in 2016. For such a time as this, God has you in this country. He has you where he has you because he wants you to be a light to the world. This last week when the Chicago Cubs won the World Series. Come on, Cubbies. I was reading in the news about the chaplain of the Cubs. Very interesting story. He said, all my life I dreamed of playing Major League Baseball, winning the World Series. He said, I never made it out of minor leagues. I wasn't good enough. I didn't get drafted and I ended up having to take odd jobs and he said, God had different plans. I started taking seminary, studying theology. And he said, I became a priest in a Catholic church. And then I was invited to pray one day with some of the baseball players from the Cubs. And they liked my prayer, so I was asked back to lead devotions week after week. I became the chaplain of the Cubs. He said, I, I knew one day I would stand on the field of a World Series game. And that day he was, that game seven, he was there by the dugout. He got to rush out with the Cubs. He said, God placed me there in a different role. I thought I'd be wearing a baseball jersey. Instead, I was wearing the outfit of a priest. But God used me to be an impact on the influencers. I'm telling you, God wants to bring you into influential places. It might be different than you thought it would be. But don't you dare doubt what God can do. Don't you limit what God can do. Daniel told King Nebuchadnezzar, he said, your dream is not a good dream. Your kingdom will be destroyed and all the kingdoms that rise up after yours. But there is a kingdom that is coming, Daniel prophesied. There is a kingdom on the way. And this kingdom in verse 44 is an unshakable kingdom. It is an indestructible kingdom. It will be the kingdom that crushes all other kingdoms. What kingdom was Daniel talking about? He wasn't talking about the kingdom of America. He wasn't talking about the kingdom of China. He wasn't talking about the kingdom of Russia. No, he was talking about the kingdom of God, a king who wasn't voted in and can't be voted out. Stand up on your feet this morning. I love how Daniel 2 ends. Daniel was so bold, he told the king a disfavorable dream. But the king was so overwhelmed by Daniel's prophecy that it says that the king fell down. He threw himself down and he began to worship the God of Daniel. He changed from being anti-Christ, anti-God, paganistic, to becoming a believer that there was a God and that Daniel's God was real. And then the king said, Daniel, I'm gonna promote you. I'm gonna honor you. Daniel said, let me tell you about my friends. And the king said, let's honor all of them, promoting them. There's not a situation that you face right now that God cannot turn around. 
There is no current situation that God is limited to perform in. There was a moment there where these guys said, it's impossible, but Daniel said, hold on, with God, nothing is impossible. Let me get God in the middle of this situation and let's see what happens. Whatever you're facing right now, whatever our nation is facing, I wanna challenge you for the next few days leading up to this election day to give something up. I'm not gonna tell you what to give up, but give something up that matters just for a few days and spend some extra time praying. Pray for God to intervene in our country that regardless of what goes on, don't just go and vote, which I think you should. And if you don't know where to vote or how to vote, go to the voter registration tables in the lobby, find out all that information. But more importantly, pray this week, pray. Spend some time like Daniel and his friends with a different diet. They spent time in God's word and prayer, rehearsing the, the miracles of God. They didn't have Bibles back then, but they had old books and scrolls of all the things God had done, reminding themselves he parted the Red Sea. He intervened for Moses. He intervened for Joseph. Joseph was in a godless land and God used Joseph to change the heart of Pharaoh. God can use us, Daniel would say to his friends. God can use us. We're not discouraged. We're not overwhelmed. They would spend time. Church, this week, let's spend time praying. Let's be engaged. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes across this room. No matter what you're facing in this room, God can do the impossible. I sense in my heart that there are some of you facing some very difficult situations. Maybe even the enemy has tried to whisper, impossible, impossible for that to happen. Maybe you feel like you've blown it with your convictions. Maybe you feel like you're condemned. Maybe you feel like you've lost something that was so special to you. You swore you'd never compromise, but you did. The good news is today the grace of God is in this place and he can restore you. He can set you free from a life of addiction, strongholds, sexual immorality, no matter how bad you feel like you missed it. I'll never forget talking to a young girl in our church who said, I've given myself away to so many boys. I can't even count. I don't even know some of their names. She said, do you think God can forgive me? Because I've messed up so much. I said, that's why you're here. God's been drawing you your whole life to a place of healing to find out there's no guy that can fix you. There's no guy that can satisfy. There's a God in heaven who can heal your heart, who can purify your life, who can make you new again. What God did for that girl, he can do for you. That girl has gone on to be a world changer. She left a lifestyle of immorality. She changed. I'll never forget hearing the testimony of Jeff Goforth in our church changing. He was a womanizer. He was constantly visiting gentlemen's clubs and constantly consumed with pornography and, and, and all kinds of just junk. But God got a hold of his life. He came down to an altar. He decided from this day forward, I choose not to defile myself with the things of this world, not because I'm legalistic, not because I'm holier than thou, but because I have a destiny and I need God's forgiveness and I need his grace and he can do it. Today, Jeff is impacting men all over. He's written a book. God wants to do something in your life. God wants to set you apart in your university, in your company, as a dad, as a mom. One of the, there's so much to this whole message, but I feel to end it right now. Just close your eyes all across this room, bow your heads. If you are choosing today to change some convictions in your life, to change some areas in your life, you're deciding today, I am going to live different. I'm gonna be like Daniel in the Bible. I am going to stand out for God. I'm gonna have convictions that change my conditions. I want you to raise your hand across this room if that's you. Something needs to change today in your life. You're choosing today. Yeah, hands going up all over this room. Maybe you need to repent today of some sin, backsliding, areas where you've compromised. Just raise your hand all over this room. You're saying today, I am choosing to live different. Today, I am choosing to live with a different conviction in my heart. Secondly, you're here today and you say, Paul, I need a miracle. Daniel was about to lose his life in chapter two, not just him, but all three of his friends. Instead, the chapter ends with them getting promoted to an even higher place. I'd call that a miracle. 
They needed God to intervene in a situation that everybody else called impossible, impossible, impossible. There are some of you here today, and I feel this in my heart, you are facing situations that look impossible. You, you have the odds stacked up against you. You need God to intervene. You need a miracle from God. I wanna pray for you today. If that's you, just lift your hand. Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's in your family. Maybe it's in your health. Maybe it's in your business, in your finances. There is no situation you're facing right now that God cannot intervene and do the impossible. All over this room, hands are going up. Today is your day for miracles. I was seeing it this morning. You're the God of miracles. You're the God of miracles. Lastly, you're here today and you say, Paul, I just need to get right with God. I need to surrender to God. If you raised your hand or that last question fits you, I want you to leave your seat. Come and meet me at this altar right now. We're going to cheer on every brave man, every brave woman, every couple, every family, every college student, every grandparent. You're not alone. Every teenager, you're not alone. Today is a day for new change in your life new convictions in your life, forgiveness, a fresh start. You need a miracle right now. God can do it. God can do the miraculous. There's nothing that is too difficult for our God to do. Bring God into the equation, whatever it is. Bring God into the equation, whatever it is. Let's sing that chorus, Cole. So I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. We believe. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of I shared this story in the last service and I just felt my spirit to share it for a dad in this room. If you're a dad in this room, you've been given an incredible position in your family. Even if your kids are grown up out of the house. My dad, when I was younger, I remember we were in a movie theater and I was with my brother and my two sisters, my mom, my dad, and it was a PG movie. But in this one moment, a woman came on the screen and, and she was very seductive and my dad looked at me and John and said boys get up let's go and we were kind of upset we were like dad we were young teenagers like 11 12 or 12 and 13 he took us outside he said guys we have different convictions we, we have different convictions for our eyes I'll never forget being in Russia on a mission trip. We were driving down the road. There was a big billboard with a very immoral picture, bad picture. My dad said, eyes down. And I was looking around. He said, eyes down, Paul. He said, we have a different conviction. I want to challenge the dads in this room. God has graced you where he's placed you. You are not intimidated by this culture. Don't let this culture intimidate you. You have a calling, you have a courage from God to stand up and impart conviction to your sons and daughters. As young adults, singles in this room, we cannot wait for somebody else to give us convictions. We've got to go to the Word of God and say, what does Jesus say? What does Jesus say? What do these scriptures say? 
I'm supposed to live on a higher level. I'm supposed to think on thoughts that are praiseworthy and true. I'm supposed to repent when I've sinned. I'm supposed to receive the grace of God by faith in Jesus Christ. I'm supposed to talk differently. I'm supposed to react differently. I'm supposed to have self-control. I'm supposed to have patience. See, when we start getting this in us, it starts changing the way we live starts changing the way we think when we face mountains we're not discouraged because we know God's with me he's for me there's no difficulty I face that God cannot help me overcome the very end of my race yesterday my wife was cheering me on don't quit Paul don't quit you're almost there my niece came running up alongside of me. She was there near the finish line. You got this, Uncle Paul. You got this. Don't quit. And I want to challenge you today. It's not, it's not just about how you start. Some of you guys may have had a rough start, may have had a rough middle, but it's about how you finish. You're in a season of your life where you got to finish strong. The race you're in is a spiritual race for a crown that will not fade. And I hear the grandstands of heaven saying, don't quit, don't quit. You got this, guys. Don't give up, dads. Don't give up, moms. Don't be condemned, son. Don't be condemned, daughter. I'm with you. I'm for you. I can hear the voice from heaven just as it was speaking to Jesus. This is my son whom I love. In him I'm well pleased today. Receive the love of God. Receive the grace of God. Receive the power of God. I want us to pray together. Say, Jesus. I surrender to you. I'm all yours. Help me, God, to stand out, to follow your word, to change my culture. Help me, Jesus. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. So I repent and I receive your forgiveness. I receive your grace. You rose from the dead and you've given me resurrection power. So I'm an overcomer. I am victorious because you live in me. I'm all yours, God. Use me for your glory. In Jesus name, amen and amen. Do you receive that church? I encourage you this week, walk in the love of God. Get out and vote, pray fast. Let's see God move in our city, in our state, in our nation. Come on, God loves you, God bless you.